So uh, we're going to continue our session on topology and general relativity. Uh, here's our outline again. There are two parts. This first part, this first part is dealing with Lorentzian geometry, which we'll continue on uh, today and, and tomorrow. We'll we'll reach uh, this second part. Uh, the, in some sense, the main part on topology and general relativity. So we're going to start today by talking about the geometry of null hypersurfaces. Um, in addition to talking about the, uh, discussing the causality of curves, you can discuss the causality of higher dimensional submanifolds. You've already heard a lot about space-like hypersurfaces, which are hypersurfaces in which the induced metric is Riemannian. Physically, it corresponds to uh, space at a given instant of time, and you've heard a lot about the uh, initial data problem associated, um, constraints associated with such space-like hypersurfaces. Uh, a null hypersurface uh, is a hypersurface such that uh, the null cone at each point of the hypersurface is actually tangent to the hypersurface. Uh, null hypersurfaces are very important in, in general relativity. They, they represent horizons of various sorts, like the event horizon in short shield or the event horizon in Kerr are null hypersurfaces. And null hypersurfaces have an interesting geometry that we want to talk about today. Uh, let me just begin with a couple of notational comments. Um, uh, this you've already seen in other talks. Um, so uh, we let uh, del here be the levitch vita connection associated uh, with the given Lorentzian metric G. We know locally uh, the, our covariant derivative operator is ex uh, determined by the Christoffel symbols in a coordinate neighborhood. And just like in the Riemannian case, uh, geodesics are curves of zero covariant acceleration. The derivative in the direction of the velocity of the velocity is zero. In general relativity, time-like geodesics correspond to freely falling observers, and uh, null geodesics correspond to the path of photons or, or light rays. Then we introduced the Riemann curvature tensor uh, involving uh, second covariant derivatives, anti-symmetrized. Uh, I think this is the same sign convention that Justin Corvino used. Uh, then we, uh, the components of the Riemann curvature tensor are determined by evaluating on coordinate vectors. Uh, we trace once, trace once the components to get the components of the space-time Ricci tensor, and then we trace with respect to the metric to get the scalar curvature. So uh, here are the Einstein equations, at least for now. I'm not including the, uh, the cosmological constant. Uh, as we all know, the Einstein equations describe how uh, space-time curves in the presence of matter. And it's this curvature that's responsible for the effects of gravity. The left-hand side is a purely geometric tensor. This is the Einstein tensor. And the right-hand side is the energy momentum tensor, which contains all information about uh, uh, energy and momentum of any matter fields or other non-gravitational fields like the electromagnetic field. This, uh, again, the vacuum Einstein equations are obtained by setting the energy momentum tensor to zero, but in fact this is equivalent to the Ricci tensor of space-time vanishing, so vacuum means uh, a Ricci flat. In some of our discussion, uh, over these lectures, we'll assume um, certain energy conditions. So we sometimes require that space times, which satisfy the Einstein equations, obey certain energy conditions. The null energy condition is the requirement that the energy momentum tensor evaluated on null vectors, x, is non-negative. The stronger dominant energy condition is, I see a typo there, uh, is the requirement that when we evaluate the energy momentum tensor on two future directed causal, vector, causal vectors, uh, that quantity uh, is non-negative. Dominant energy condition is satisfied by, by most classical fields. Um, since we're uh, requiring space-time to obey, to satisfy the Einstein equations, these energy conditions 
are in fact curvature conditions. They're curvature conditions. And notice in particular for the, the null energy condition, if you look at the Einstein equations and feed in a pair of null vectors uh, into the Einstein equations, that term vanishes. And so uh, as a geometric condition, the null energy condition is equivalent to saying the space-time Ricci tensor evaluated on null vectors is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so let's uh, now begin our discussion of null hypersurfaces and let's define them in a more precise or formal way. So null hypersurface in space-time is a smooth co-dimension co one submanifold such that uh, at each point the uh, space-time metric is degenerate on the tangent space of the null hypersurface. Um, and degeneracy means, well, in the Lorentzian case, um, there in fact can only be, uh, due to the Lorentz signature, there can only be one degenerate direction. So, so degeneracy here means in the case of a, a, a Lorentzian metric is that there's a non-zero vector, the direction of degeneracy, which is perpendicular to everything in the tangent space to S at P. Um, here I'm, for this, for this talk today, I'm using these little wedge products to represent the space-time metric G, just simplifies notation a little bit. Um, so uh, as, a, as a consequence of this degeneracy condition, in particular, KP is a null vector, you let X be KP, uh, and we can choose that null vector to be future pointing. And the normal space to KP uh, within, the, uh, within the tangent space of S is, in fact, all, all of the tangent space. Um, this is essentially the degeneracy. Uh, and any other vector, not a multiple of this null vector, is going to be space-like. So all follows essentially from this, this condition. So these are... So, so in a null hypersurface, at each point, we've got this future-directed null vector that uh, is the direction of degeneracy. And you can, you can um, scale these null vectors in a uniform way to produce a null vector field, future-directed null vector field on our null hypersurface. So, so this is fundamental. Every, every uh, null hypersurface gives rise to a smooth uh, future-directed null vector field K. So the null vector field associated to null hypersurface is fundamental, and that vector field is unique up to, up to positive scale factors, unique to, up to positive scaling. Uh, well, in Minkowski space, some, some typical null hypersurfaces are null hyperplanes, null hyperplanes. Uh, also, the null cones, boundary of a future of a point or boundary of past of a point, these are smooth null hypersurfaces away from the vertex. And then we come to this proposition 2.2, which is, which is fundamental. And it says the following, let S be a smooth, smooth null hypersurface and let K be a smooth future directed null vector field on S. Every null hypersurface comes with such a uh, uh, null vector field. And again, unique up to scaling. Then the integral curves of K are null geodesics. Uh, when suitably parameterized. Okay. Um, the, integral, the integral curves of our null vector field are called the, the null generators. And they're intrinsic to the null hypersurface up to parameterization. So these, uh, the, the integral curves of K are, are null geodesics up to parameterization. And, and this is such a fundamental result. Let's, let's walk through the proof. Um, we, what do we want to show? We want to show that the covariant derivative in the direction k of k is proportional to k. Proportional to k, that, that means it's going to be a pre-geodesic. And then if you, you can reparameterize to make the right-hand side 0. So this is really what we want to show, that this covariant derivative, covariant acceleration, is proportional to k. And uh, this follows, provided we can show that this covariant derivative is perpendicular to all the tangent vectors uh, to S at, say, any point P. So this is what we want to show. At the point P, this covariant derivative uh, dotted into any tangent vector at P is 0. Uh, so, here, here's a little, so here's the argument. I won't go through too much detail. 
But here's P and here's our vector X at P. And then extend it along uh, the integral curve of K, extend it along K, extend it along the flow generated by K. And, and so making it invariant under the flow generated by K. So that means this, uh, this bracket uh, is equal to zero. So covariant derivative K in the direction X will be equal to the covariant derivative X in the direction K. Um, and uh, uh, as we extend X invariantly along uh, this null geodesic generator, it will remain uh, per, uh, tangent to S, and so this dot product will, re, will be zero all along the generator. And then we apply, this is a, this is a directional derivative of this dot product, we apply the, uh, the metric product rule. The metric product rule gives us this, and then you apply the metric product, product rule one more time and you get this, but k dot k is zero along S, and so this directional derivative is zero. Okay, well, anyway, there's a little bit of the argument that shows that the, uh, the integral curves or vector field K are, are geodesics when they're uh, appropriately parameterized. Now, we're interested in studying uh, the shape of a null hypersurface S. Um, and to study the shape of uh, S, uh, we want to study how K varies along S. Now, although K is tangent to S, uh, in this null geometry, it's also perpendicular to S. So if we want to study how K varies along S, this is somewhat analogous how we uh, study the shape of, say, a, a hypersurface in Riemannian geometry or the shape of uh, a space-like hypersurface in Lorentzian geometry by studying how the normal varies. And so this is what we want to do. We want to, we want to introduce objects like... Um, in, in, in the Riemannian case or Lorentzian case of space-like hypersurfaces, objects like uh, the shape operator or Weingarten map and second fundamental form. And so that's the approach we're going to take. Now, we, uh, in this null geometry case, we have to deal with this degeneracy. We have to deal with these degenerate directions. And uh, this causes uh, some complication. Uh, uh, what we're not going to do is, say, introduce special coordinates or gauge conditions to deal with this. Instead, we're going to be working, we're going to be working mod k. And uh, that is, we're, we're going to be quotienting out everything by k, and then the, de the degeneracy disappears. Um, and once you buy into this, pro uh, this approach, things, things go uh, rather nicely. And I didn't invent this approach, but it does work well in this situation. So we want to introduce the null Weingarten map, and, uh, or null shape operator, and the null second fundamental form. And we introduce, we introduce um, uh, an equivalence relation. So we have uh, at uh, any two vectors x and y in the tangent space of s at p, we say x equals y mod k if and only if the difference is proportional to k. And we let x bar denote the equivalence class of x. And then this TPS mod k, this is the collection of all such equivalence classes. Okay? So we call this, we call this the, the mod k a tangent space of p, the mod k tangent space. And then you can take the union of all these tangent spaces, and you get the, the mod k tangent bundle. TS mod k is a mod k tangent bundle. So it's just the tangent bundle, but we've quotiented it out by k. And uh, this is a smooth rank, uh, rank n minus 1. S has dimension n. Space time has dimension n plus 1. This is a rank n minus 1 vector bundle over S. Um, and, and in fact, this, this vector bundle does not be depend on the particular choice of null vector field K. Um, in, in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, mod K tangent bundle, mod K tangent space, K, the equivalence class of K is the zero vector, basically. Um, then there's a natural positive definite metric H on the mod K tangent bundle, adduced from the space-time metric. And, and here's how it's defined. Uh, you take a pair of vectors in the mod k tangent space, h of x bar y bar, that's equal to uh, x, x dot y uh, with respect to the space-time metric. 
Now, you need to show that this is well-defined, this definition, that it, it doesn't depend on the particular representative of the equivalence class. And that's a simple computation. You know, you let, if x prime equals x mod k and y prime equals y mod k, then you can look at x prime dot y prime, and you sort of expand everything out and use the fact that k is perpendicular to everything in the tangent space, and you get x dot y, okay? Um, it's positive definite. That comes from the fact that every vector not proportional to k um, is space-like. So we have this positive definite metric on the uh, mod k tangent bundle. Now we introduce the null Weingarten map, uh, B, with respect to the given null vector field k. Um, and at each point p, it's a, it's a linear map uh, defined as follows. So you take the covariant derivative of k and the direction x and then take that equivalence class. Again, there's a simple argument to show that uh, this does not depend on the choice of representative of x bar. Um, so, so this covariant de derivative, I mean, that's the thing that tells you how k is varying, wiggling along, along the null hypersurface. So this is equivalent to how you define the Weingarten map, say, for space-like hypersurfaces in a Lorentzian manifold. Um, uh, then uh, you can show that uh, the null Weingarten map is self-adjoint with respect to H, which means this relationship holds. It's self-adjoint. Uh, I, I won't go through the proof, really. The proof, once you unravel definitions of what H of B X bar comma Y bar is, it's that. And then once you reach this point, then it's a, it's a, it's a standard argument, that the same kind of argument that's used to show that the second fundamental or the, the shape operator associated to a space like hyper, hypersurface is self-adjoint with respect to the induced metric. And then, then we can introduce the null second fundamental form uh, with respect to the null vector field K, and that's, that's just uh, the bilinear form associated with the Weingarten map via our positive definite metric H. That is B, capital B of X bar Y bar is H of B of X bar Y bar. And when you unravel definitions, we have that B of X bar Y bar is this expression here. And since B is self-adjoint, little b is self-adjoint, the null second fundamental form is symmetric. Okay. Then we can introduce the null mean curvature or null expansion of S with respect to the null vector field K. And that's a smooth scalar. That's a smooth scalar on S. Uh, it's defined by, at each point, taking the trace of the Weingarten map. Again, all these notes are, are online, but um, in case you don't feel like taking notes. Um, now, theta, this, this null expansion scalar theta has a natural geometric interpretation, and I want to say a few words about that. Um, so, so here's a little picture. So we let sigma be the intersection of our null hypersurface assay uh, with respect to, say, a space-like hypersurface, smooth space-like hypersurface, that, um, that passes through this point P here. Uh, so we fixed a point P in S. And um, uh, near that point P, sigma will be a smooth co-dimension two within space-time, co-dimension two space-like submanifold. And here I've uh, repeated the picture again. And we let E1 down to En, n minus 1, so sigma has dimension n minus 1. Let E1 down to en, en minus 1 be an orthonormal basis for this space-like submanifold uh, with respect to the induced metric on sigma, which is positive definite. And then, uh, then E1 bar down to En minus 1 bar is, in fact, an orthonormal basis for the mod k tangent space at the point P. So we're interested in theta, which is the trace of B. It's given by this standard exp expression for the trace with respect to an orthonormal basis. But by definition, this is the second sum, summing the second fundamental form 
on this basis. And again, when you unravel definitions, theta is equal to this sum, summation uh, derivative of k in the direction ei dot ei. So this we, this we write as the divergence of k along sigma. And I, and I should have emphasized that uh, you know, uh, k is everywhere orthogonal to this, to sigma, because it's orthogonal to everything in the tangent space, in particular the tangent spaces of sigma. And, and so this, this theta, the geometric interpretation, is it's given, given, uh, giving us the divergence of that null vector field k along sigma. And um, what theta measures the overall expansion of the null generators of s, s towards the future. And uh, you know, here's say is a future cone in Minkowski space uh, away from the vertex. That's a smooth null hypersurface. It has theta positive. The null generators are spreading out towards the future. And here, the past cone theta is negative. Okay, so theta measures the uh, uh, overall uh, uh, expansion of the null geodesic generators towards the future. Now, what, what, what if we choose a different null vector field, k tilde? So I want to make a comment about effective scaling. So let k tilde be some other null vector field on S. It will equal to f times k for some smooth positive function, f. Um, and, uh, and then you can show this is I mean, a, a, a simple exercise to show that the uh, Weingarten map Null Weingarten map with respect to k tilde is just equal to f times the Weingarten map with respect to k. So the scaling is very simple here. The scaling is very simple. In particular, if at a given point k tilde and k agree, then at that point that means f is equal to 1. And, and so in fact, if k and k tilde agreed at a point, then the associated uh, null Weingarten maps are exactly the same. So what this, uh, what this says is that the null, null Weingarten map uh, with respect to a given null vector field k is it at a given point, it's uniquely determined by the value of k at that point. Uh, you can then also, by tracing, you also get this relationship, the relationship of the null expansion with respect to k and k tilde. You get the theta tilde is f times theta. So it's not the same point-wise, but the sign's the same. That's the point. So when we say the null generators are expansing, expanding toward the future, that's independent of the choice of the null vector field. Now we want to do some comparison theory. If you're familiar at all with comparison theory in Hermannian geometry or Lorentzian geometry, we want to do some comparison theory uh, with respect to a null hypersurface. So we want to study how the null Weingarten map, want to study how the null Wein, Weingarten map varies as we move along, we move along uh, a null geodesic generator. So, um, so we let A to be a, a future directed, and we're taking it to be affinely parameterized null geodesic generator of S. So here's eta. It's a null geodesic, and we parameterized it to be affinely parameterized. And then we choose a null vector field on k uh, so that k at any point on eta, eta of s, k agrees uh, uh, with the tangent vector velocity vector eta prime of s at eta of s. Okay? So we let k be a null vector field which agrees with eta prime along eta. You can always construct such a k at least, at least near, near eta. Um, and then... Uh, with respect to that null vector field, we let B of S be the uh, null Weingarten map uh, associated to K at the point A of S. B of S is the null Weingarten map of K uh, at A of S. So this gives us now a one parameter family of null Weingarten maps along, the, along this null geodesic. And uh, it involves uh, this, this one parameter family satisfies a very important uh, differential equation. The one parameter family of Weingarten maps obeys the following Riccati equation. B prime plus B squared plus R equals zero, where prime means covariant derivative in the direction of eta prime. Here, 
Uh, R is a linear transformation at each uh, uh, tangent space mod eta prime. Uh, it's a linear transformation defined in terms of the curvature tensor of space-time. R here is the curvature tensor of space-time, and uh, this, is what, this is what the R is in, uh, in this Riccati equation. Uh, there's a remark here on notation. What do we mean by saying taking the covariant derivative of y bar means taking the usual covariant where y is a vector field uh, along eta tangent to s. You take the usual covariant derivative in the direction of eta and then bar it. And that's it. that again is independent of representative. And then uh, uh, the definition of the covariant derivative of b. Uh, this is just the usual sort of tensorial definition uh, sort of motivated by the product rule. This, okay. So anyway, we have this Riccati equation, and uh, here's the proof of it. And I'm not going to go through the proof, but I, I did want to put the slide up. Once you just sort of set things up, it's really just, it's really just a few lines. So it's a, very, it's a very slick proof once things are set up properly to establish that Riccati equation. Um, then we take the trace of that Riccati equation. So tr take the trace, and when you do the computation, you take the trace, you get this equation for the, now theta, remember, is our null expansion scalar. It's a scalar, so theta prime now is just, uh, we're looking at theta along this null geodesic eta. Theta prime is really just the derivative with respect to s along the null geodesic generator. So we have theta prime equals minus Ricci eta prime eta prime. Eta prime is the tangent vector to eta. Here, Ricci is just the space-time space -time Ricci tensor. This sigma here is the so-called shear scalar, and it's defined in terms of the, uh, tra the square of the trace-free part of uh, the Weingarten map. And it's, uh, sigma is a non-negative number. And we get this term involving uh, the null expansion squared. So this, in, in, in relativity, this is known as the, the Rachel-Dury equation in a specific situation, Rachel-Dury equation for an irrotational null geodesic congruence. And this equation shows how the Ricci curvature of space-time uh, influences the null mean curvature of a null hypersurface. So this is, this is really important in relativity. Um, and I want to consider a basic application of the ratio dury equation. Okay. So, and that's this proposition 2.4. Let M be a space-time which obeys the null energy condition. Okay, there it is. We're using it in the geometric form. Reach xx greater than or equal to zero for all null vectors x. Uh, and let S be a smooth null hypersurface in M. Now, if the null generators of S, when affinely parameterized, are future geodesically complete, when the, when the uh, null geodesic generators are future geodesically complete, then S must have non-negative, S must have non-negative null expansion. Okay? And let's look at the proof of that. So here's S, go to some point P and S, and suppose, and here's our, so we're, here's P, and uh, uh, we look at this null geodesic generator eta through P, P is say eta of zero, and suppose that the null expansion were actually negative at that point, theta were negative at that point. So we know uh, we have this one parameter family of Weingarten maps along eta that gives a rise to uh, this expansion scalar along eta. And we know that the expansion scalar is invariant, uh, the sign is invariant under uh, whatever null vector field you're looking at. And so the assumption that theta at p is negative means 
along this null geodesic generator, this null expansion function has theta of zero as theta of zero negative. Okay? So we're starting out with theta negative. Um, so these first couple of sen sentences sort of describe this picture here. And um, now we make crucial use of the ratio Dury equation. If we go back, the Ricci curvature is non uh, is non negative. Uh, these two terms uh, come in with a minus sign, so the whole left-hand side is uh, non-positive. So uh, uh, let me back up here again. This term is non-positive, and so we get that d theta ds satisfies this differential inequality, keeping that theta squared term. Now, theta starts out negative, and the derivative is, derivative is negative, so it continues to be negative for all s positive. We're assuming a is future complete. And so we can divide by both this differential inequality. We can divide by theta squared, and this is the result. And this must be valid for all s positive. Uh, but, but this is a uniform bound on, on this derivative, and, and this shows... This starts out negative, but this shows that this quantity must go to zero. That is to say, theta must go to minus infinity in finite affine parameter time. But that contradicts the fact that um, theta is, is smooth all the way along this future complete null geodesic generator. Okay. So this is a rather typical application of, uh, of the ratio Dury equation. So this is the argument that shows, uh, given a null hypersurface, if the null geodesic generators are future complete, you must have theta non-negative. Um, that implies, in particular, if you go back and look at that little local, local cross-section that we called sigma by intersecting the null hypersurface with a space-like hypersurface, take that little local cross-section and uh, move it along the flow generated by K, theta being non-negative means that the the, uh, the area of that piece of sigma increases or at least non-decreases towards the future. Um, and this is, uh, so, so, so area of cross-sections must increase towards the future or at least be non-decreasing. And this is the, the most, this proposition then that we've discussed uh, is the simplest form of Hawking's black hole, famous black hole area theorem, uh, second law, of black hole thermodynamics. Oh, okay. So that completes uh, our discussion of geodesic null hypersurfaces. Let me move on to the to the last uh, section of part one. So we we'll want to use some of the machinery we've developed to uh, discuss and and prove uh, the the classical Penrose singularity theorem and, and some results related to that. So, uh, um, Penrose's singularity theorem uh, uh, relies critically on the notion of a trapped surface, which is the concept he introduced. And so, uh, we want to define what we mean by a trapped surface. So here's the setup. We're in an n plus one dimensional space time. Sigma is uh, closed, that is compact without boundary. Here's its picture. Co dimension two, space like submanifold. If you go to any point, so, so, so sigma is co dimension two within space time, space like. And when you look at the uh, normal space to sigma at any point, that will be a two-dimensional time-like plane. So the induced metric will be Lorentzian on this two-dimensional plane. And so at each point, you get these, uh, in, these independent null uh, vectors, L plus and L minus. Okay? And under appropriate orientation assumptions, this actually gives rise, this actually gives rise, sigma admits two smooth null normal vector fields, L plus and L minus. 
So here's, we've got our sigma, we've got two null normal vector fields along sigma within space time. And just by convention, we'll refer to L plus as outward pointing and L minus as inward pointing. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, again, we're working towards the definition of a trapped surface. Uh, associated to, associated to these null normal vector fields are two so-called null second fundamental forms along sigma, chi plus and chi minus. And uh, here's how chi plus minus are defined. It's the dot product of the covariant derivative of L plus minus in the direction X dot, uh, dotted into Y. So these, I, these, these objects, chi plus minus, are, are measuring how these null vector fields are varying along sigma. And then we can take the trace. Uh, we can take the trace of these null second fundamental forms, this chi plus minus associated to L plus minus, uh, with respect to the induced metric gamma on sigma, and you get the so-called null expansion scalars or null mean curvatures along along theta along sigma. So theta plus minus is essentially the divergence of L plus minus along sigma. Um, from these definitions, you can show that the sine uh, of theta plus minus is invariant under the scaling of L plus minus. We haven't uh, set any particular scale. And physically, theta plus measures the divergence of the outgoing null geodesics, divergence of the outgoing light rays uh, from sigma. And theta minus measures the divergence of the ingoing light rays from sigma. Now, you know, there is a connection between these null expansion scalars and uh, the null expansion scalars of null hypersurfaces we uh, talked about a few minutes ago. Um, so, uh, for, say, focusing on L plus, so, so L plus along sigma gives rise to a smooth null hypersurface near sigma by uh, just shooting out the null, the null geodesics from sigma with initial tangent L plus. So just move out a little bit in the direction L plus the null geodesics. That generates a null hypersurface. And um, you can compute the null expansion of that null hypersurface, as we discussed already for null hypersurfaces. And, and what you see is that, say, theta plus uh, uh, are uh, null expansions, outward null expansions, theta uh, scalar to sigma, is just the null expansion of this null hypersurface we've generated uh, restricted to sigma. So there is indeed a natural relationship between the null expansion scalars we've defined along sigma and an expansion of null hypersurfaces. Okay. Now, uh, if you look at, say, round spheres in Euclidean slices of Minkowski space. So here's a Euclidean slice in Minkowski space. Here's a round sphere. Uh, then you have theta plus positive and theta minus negative, where we're using sort of the natural choice for outward and inward. And the same is true if you look at, look at say, a large radial sphere in an asymptotically flat space-like hypersurface. You'll have theta plus positive and theta minus negative. However, in regions of space-time where the gravitational field, not remote areas, but where the gravitational field is very strong, you can have both theta minus negative and theta plus negative. So both families, both families of outward uh, null geodesics are converging on average. And this is called, this is the def, this is what's called a trapped surface. Um, again, the, con the, the important concept introduced by Penrose. There's been some uh, outstanding work on results concerning, uh, by solutions to the Einstein equation, the dynamical uh, formation of trapped surfaces. Okay, so now we're going to discuss that under appropriate energy and causality condition, if a trapped surface forms, then the development of singularities in a certain sense is inevitable. And this is, this is the Penrose singularity theorem. Uh, so let M be a, so here's the statement of the Penrose singularity here. Let N be a globally hyperbolic spacetime which satisfies the null energy condition, reaching non-negative. 
uh, on null vectors, and which has a non-compact Cauchy surface S. Then if M contains a trap surface sigma, then M is future null geodesically incomplete. Okay. Um, this is a natural energy condition. Most of the singularity theorems require an energy condition. Um, Non-compact Cauchy surface, this is consistent with uh, the way we model an isolated gravitating system by taking an asymptotically flat space-like hypersurface. So that's sort of what we're thinking about in the, in the Penrose singularity theorem. And then the conclusion is that uh, space-time is future null geodesically complete. In this sense, is somehow coming to an end towards the future. And typically, such incompleteness, for example, in short shield space-time, such incompleteness is associated with gravitational collapse in the formation of a black hole. Okay. We'll have more to talk about black holes uh, tomorrow. And so let me say a few words, let me say a few words about the proof. Um, the first is this claim that uh, the boundary of the time-like future of our trapped surface sigma must be non-compact, okay? Well, suppose it was compact. Um, we know that, again, from, from yesterday, the, the boundary of the time-like future of sigma, this is, this is what is defined to be an achronal boundary. And this is, uh, uh, from our discussion yesterday, necessarily an achronal C0 hypersurface. Now, if this achronal C0 hypersurface is also compact, we discussed another result that said it must necessarily be a compact Cauchy surface for the space-time. Okay? Compact achronal boundaries in globally hyperbolic space-times must be Cauchy surfaces. But this contradicts the fact that we're assuming we're given a non-compact Cauchy surface S. All Cauchy surfaces have the same topology. Okay? So in fact, uh, the boundary of the future of sigma is non-compact. And then from this, we're going to actually construct a future inextendable null geodesic, geodesic in the boundary, which, uh, which must be future incomplete. So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so first observing uh, uh, the following. So we're looking at the boundary of the time-like future of sigma. That's, this is just the you know, point set topology now. That's the closure of I plus of sigma minus the interior of I plus of sigma. Now, since we're in a globally hyperbolic space-time, the closure of I plus of sigma is, in fact, just J plus of sigma. Okay. Remember, in globally hyperbolic space-times, these, uh, for sigma compact, J plus of sigma is closed. So in our setup with sigma compact and a global hyperbolic, the closure of I plus the sigma is just J plus the sigma. And then I plus of sigma, I plus of anything is always open, so the interior of I plus the sigma is just I plus the sigma. So in fact, the boundary of I plus the sigma is just J plus the sigma minus uh, I plus the sigma. So, uh, so if we take, here's our sigma, and we take a point Q on the boundary of the time-like future of sigma, which is J plus, uh, so, uh, so here's Q, it's in, J, it's in J plus of sigma minus I plus of sigma, so in other words, there's some point P, such Q is in the causal future of P, um, but it's not in the time-like future of sigma, so certainly it's not in the time-like future of P. So we have, a, we have a point Q that's in the causal future of P, but not in the time-like future of P. And as we discussed yesterday, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, any causal curve, and there is one, from P to Q must be a null geodesic. If you're in the causal future but not the time-like future, then you're actually joined by a null geodesic. Okay? So, uh, then there has, so Q actually relies on a null geodesic on the boundary uh, from, from Q down to this point P on sigma. So every point Q on 
the, uh, on the boundary of the time-like future, is joined to some point on sigma by the null geodesic. And moreover, moreover, that null geodesic, I mean, there's some geometry here, uh, that null geodesic must meet sigma orthogonally. If it didn't, you'd get a violation, you'd get a violation of achronality of the achronal boundary, boundary of the future. Okay, um, so where are we? So that's this discussion here. Now we know that this is a closed set, topologically closed, and non-compact. So that means uh, there's going to exist a, remember I'm trying to construct a future in extendable null geodesic that's incomplete. Uh, so this is closed but non-compact, non so there's going to be a sequence of points on the boundary of I plus a sigma that diverges to infinity. If you're closed and non-compact. Uh, how, well, how do you make divergence of divergence to infinity precise? So one, one way to do it is just introduce a complete Ramanian metric on space-time. And uh, we can find a sequence of points such that the distance in this Ramanian metric from sigma to QK goes to infinity. So this is, this is one way to specify um, a sequence of points on the boundary uh, that uh, diverges to infinity. And then, um, uh, then for, for each, so let's go back. For each QK, <coughs> I, our previous discussion at the top, for each QK, there's going to be a null geodesic uh, from the point PK on sigma to, to QK <coughs> that meets sigma orthogonally. And then we can use, uh, this is A to K, and then by the compactness of sigma, uh, we'll get some subsequence uh, say, a PKJ that converges to some point P and some null geodesic eta, uh, which is the geodesic limit of eta, eta, k sub j. Okay? So these null geodesic segments that are getting further and further out towards infinity will converge in the sense of geodesics to a null geodesic eta. Uh, say meeting sigma at p, and it will be, it will be perpendicular to sigma. So I have, and, and this eta that we, this limit null geodesic we have will be future and extendable. That's a consequence of the fact that uh, these points, these points are going to infinity. Okay. So now we have this uh, future and extendable null geodesic orthogonal to sigma. And suppose it was complete, future complete, as a null geodesic. Um, well, uh, we're going to run into a contradiction. Um, this, is a, this is not going to be carried out in too much detail. Um, this, this null geodesic uh, we have constructed, future inextendable null geodesic, lies on the boundary of the future of sigma. And uh, it's a fact that there can't be, so I want to sort of look at the, a neighborhood of eta um, with respect to points P, uh, with respect to points that are on sigma near P. In any case, there can't be another null orthogonal null geodesic that, that meets it, that meets eta, uh, because then you'd have a null geodesic followed by a null geodesic. That's going to imply the existence of a time-like geodesic uh, to sigma, and that would violate the achronality of, uh, of this achronal boundary. So as you, as you look at null geodesics moving out from sigma, none of them can, can meet eta. And, and moreover, um, as, as stated in the slide, uh, there can be no, no null 
uh, focal points to sigma along eta. Now, we're not getting into this important geometric discussion, but uh, there are, null geode there are no norm null normal geodesics that can meet eta, and there can be near, near the point P, no focal points means, very roughly speaking, that there can't be any, any null normal geodesics that meet sigma, uh, say, to first order, to first order. There's no first order focusing of null normal geodesics uh, to any point of eta. Well, what this means is that near this point P, when you look at the exponent, null exponential normal math uh, near this point P, uh, there's no crossing, there's no focal points, if you stay especially close to P, that null normal exponential map is gonna be smooth and when you exponentiate, exponentiate out the null normal geodesics near eta, uh, what you get, in fact, is uh, a smooth, uh, perhaps very thin, and here's a picture of it, smooth, perhaps very thin, null hypersurface S contained in the boundary of the future of P. So um, by, this, by this geometric construction, we now have eta living in a... Uh, smooth uh, null hypersurface H. And now uh, we use the trapped condition. Uh, again, we can look at the null expansion uh, theta of this null hypersurface H along eta. And since, since sigma is a trapped surface, the null expansion at this point must be negative. And so we're in exactly the situation we're in in the area theorem. Uh, using ratio Dury equation in the null energy condition, the null expansion along this null hypersurface, along eta in this null hypersurface, must go to minus infinity in finite aff affine parameter time. On the other hand, if eta is complete, future complete, then theta's got to be well defined all the way out to infinity. And so uh, we have uh, a contradiction. This eta that we've constructed must be, must be future incomplete. Uh, so this is a, a version of the proof of the, of the Penrose singularity theorem. Uh, it has some advantages over, um, uh, say, perhaps more standard uh, 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 arguments. In this argument, we're actually, in a sense, constructing what's incomplete. Uh, and also, uh, there are versions of the, uh, of the Penrose singularity theorem where the null energy condition can be weakened. Uh, for example, uh, in an appropriate sense, the Penrose singularity theorem holds even if, say, the, the integral along null geodesics of the Ricci curvature is, is uh, non-negative. So you can have local violations of the energy condition as long as it holds on the average. Uh, and this method of proof allows you to, to do that kind of weakening. Okay, very good. So... We talked about null hypersurfaces today, and we use methods over the last two days to present the proof of the famous Penrose singularity theorem. Now, there are, and this is a nice stopping point for today, there are uh, a couple of consequences uh, that I uh, uh, want to talk about are variations of the Penrose singularity theorem and cons consequence of that that uh, leads directly into, begins to lead directly into our discussion of topology. So there's a little bit left to do in this section, but it, 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 it's natural to, to start with it uh, tomorrow. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you.